Welcome everybody to pattern recognition. So today we want to look into the actual linear discriminant analysis and how to compute it in a rank reduced form. So today we really go into discriminant analysis and what we talk about today is the so-called rank reduced linear discriminant analysis. So we've seen already that our problem was how to choose an L dimensional subspace with L equals to K minus one where K is the number of classes and this is supposed to be a subspace that is good for this linear discriminant analysis. So now the idea that we want to follow is to maximize the spread of the L-dimensional projection of the centroids and we already know a method that can do that and this is the so-called principal component analysis. So we calculate the principal components of the covariance of the mean vectors. So you remember we can transform of course using phi our mean vectors and then we can do that for all of our classes. So the principal component analysis, as you may know from introduction to pattern recognition, is a mapping that computes a linear transform phi that results in the highest spread of the projected features. So this has an objective function and here we are looking for the transform phi star that is the maximum over this term now this term may look a little complex, but you can see here, this is already the version for our classes. So we take the means of our classes y, and then we subtract the distance to the other means, and we essentially take the two norm of these transformed matrices. Now here we type out the two norm as this inner product of the two vectors and then of course we compute the mean over all classes k and at the same time we apply a regularization. So if you see here on the right hand side we have some additional regularization and this is essentially a sum over the different regularization terms and here you see that this is lambda i times and then the two norm of phi i where phi i is essentially the ith row vector of phi. So this essentially means that we're looking for a matrix where the individual row vectors have a norm of one. And the method that we are using to bring in these constraints that the row vectors have a length of one is given by the so-called Lagrange multipliers. So note that we have to introduce this kind of regularization, these constraints, because we're doing a maximization over the space of transforms and I could very easily maximize the left-hand side term of our maximization problem simply by maximizing all of the entries of phi. So if I let them go towards infinity, then I will also get a maximization of the entire term. However, this is not what we're looking for. Then we need to introduce these constraints. So in case you forgot about Lagrangian multipliers, let's have a short refresher. Generally, this is a method to include constraints into the optimization and we will use this technique quite frequently for the rest of this class. So if you have trouble with this, you may want to consult some math textbook in order to get acquainted with the concept. So let's look into some simple example. Here we have simply a function x plus y and you already see again as in the previous example this is not a bounded function. So if we want to maximize x plus y we would simply go to x or y towards infinity and that would essentially give us the maximum of this function. So generally this is not so nice in terms, well it's actually quite easy to optimize because I can look at the function and say look the maximum is at infinity. But 
that may be a quick solution, but it's not so useful, right? So in cases like this one, you may want to work with constraints. Now the constraint that we choose as an example here is x squared plus y squared equals to one, meaning that I want to have the solutions on the circle that I'm indicating here in the plot. So what I now have to do is I somehow have to bring the constraint and our maximization together. And this essentially needs a solution where we map our circle onto our solution space. And then our feasible set here is indicated with the deformed circle. So our solutions must lie on that particular circle because otherwise we would not be fulfilling the constraint. Now, how can I bring this into the optimization? Well, one approach to go are the Lagrange multipliers, and this brings us to the Lagrangian function. So here I take the original maximization problem, and then I add the constraint with a multiplicative factor lambda, and this lambda is then used to enforce this constraint. Now you see that our original function was dependent on x and y, and the Lagrangian function is now dependent on x, y, and lambda. So lambda is essentially an increase of dimensionality. And in this higher dimensional space, we can then see that all of the solutions that are solutions to our regularized problem must fulfill the constraint that the partial derivative or the gradient with respect to all variables needs to be zero. So you see that we compute the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x, to y, and to lambda, and set it to zero. Now you could say, okay, I could maximize the same thing in the original function with computing the partials with x and y, but we essentially introduce this additional coordinate, and you will see that only points extremal places in this higher dimensional space where the derivative with respect to lambda equals to zero are essentially solutions on the feasible set. And if I look at the Lagrangian function, if I compute the partial derivative with respect to lambda, essentially the original objective, the x and y, will cancel out because they are not dependent on lambda. And all that remains is the x squared plus y squared minus one. This needs to be zero, so I can solve it for x squared plus y squared equals one. So you see that essentially enforcing the partial derivative with respect to lambda being zero is creating a necessary condition that our extremal places can only be extrema in this place if the condition is satisfied. So all extremal positions in this space will have at least the necessary condition that the constraint is fulfilled. So this is a very nice idea how we can map our original problem into a higher dimensional space and solve essentially both of the, the optimization problem while preserving the constraint. What you quite often see in classes that are more looking into what's implementing and engineering solutions is that their interpretation of the Lagrange function is that the lambda is actually some kind of engineering constant. So they just set a value for lambda, of course, a, a value that is then chosen by the user. And you can see that any violation of the constraint in this case, so if we are not on the circle, will introduce cost. And if you choose then lambda appropriately, you essentially force solutions to be pulled towards the circle because not being on the circle will cause cost. And then you will also more likely find solutions. Yet, actually, lambda is an increase in dimensionality and lambda is actually one of our search variables such that we can solve this optimization problem. Okay, a very short primer into Lagrangian optimization. Now let's go back to our original problem. And one thing that I want to use in the following are two shortcuts from the matrix cookbook. Again, here the link to the matrix cookbook, www.matrixcookbook.com. So it should be rather easy to memorize for you guys. And here we will use the following two identities. Well, the first one is 
if we have some kind of expected value that is following a mean vector mu and a covariance sigma, then we can replace this expected value and a transformation of the individual features x by a transform a. This can be rewritten into the trace of a sigma a transpose plus a times mu transpose a mu. Also note in this identity, if I had a normalization to mu equals to zero, so I'm forcing essentially everything to be centered, then the right hand term would cancel out. So we would only have the trace of the matrix A times the covariance matrix times A transpose. Now this trace is kind of interesting and this brings us to the second shortcut, the matrix derivative of a trace with respect to A or in the next time then this is going to be X. So if you're actually interested in computing this partial derivative with respect to X, yeah, you see this is still the similar setup as the trace in the line above, then this can be rewritten into x times b transpose plus x times b. And now very interesting about this is as well that if b were a covariance matrix, then the transpose would essentially not change the matrix because it's symmetric. And this way you could even write this down as 2x plus b. So let's look into our rank reduced linear discriminant analysis. And here we see that we can rearrange this a little bit. So you see that our feature transform is applied to our class means and also to all the other means. And this means we can actually pull this guy out. So we end up with the difference of the class means to all the other means or essentially the complete um, mean transform. This essentially means that our distribution is mean free. So we have a zero mean vector in the transformed space. And this then allows us to use the previous trick with the trace. And here you see then that we simply have the interclass covariance matrix. And then we have the trace of phi times the interclass covariance matrix, essentially the covariance matrix of the mean vectors. And this is multiplied again with phi transpose. So you see the other two terms that were introduced in the matrix cookbook, they cancel out because our distribution is mean free in this case, which then eliminates this from our equation. Now you see we have this trace and we know from our matrix cookbook that we can simplify this trace by simply writing this up as phi times covariance inter plus phi times covariance inter transpose. And this, of course, we can rewrite as two times phi sigma inter. And on the right hand side, we have a derivative of an L2 norm. And this L2 norm derivative, we can simply write down as two times the number of Lagrangian multipliers in a vector, and then we get our original feature transform phi. So you see that we can simplify this quite a bit, and this necessarily has to be zero. So you can see that if we divide by two now, this essentially gives us the eigenvalue problem and eigenvector problem, sigma inter phi transpose equals to lambda prime phi transpose. So note that we essentially got rid of the minus in order by introducing this lambda prime. Have a look here. This is from the original PCA. So there the transform matrix is created by maximizing the spread over all the features using the covariance matrix of all the features. So here you essentially end up with the problem that you have sigma and then phi transpose equals to lambda prime and phi transpose again. So again, we have this eigenvector eigenvalue problem. And this then can be computed, of course, by simply computing the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of 
our respective covariance matrices. So for the rank reduced linear discriminant analysis, you need to apply it to the interclass covariance matrix. And in the normal PCA, you would apply it to the regular covariance matrix. So let's look at the steps that we actually need to compute our rank reduced linear discriminant analysis. So we go ahead and compute now the covariance matrix of the transform mean vectors. So in the first step from the previous video, you remember that we first apply the normalization with respect to the general covariance matrix and transform into this normalized space. And then we compute in this normalized space the covariance over our class means. And yeah, then the mean of means is of course the mean over all the mean vectors. Now you compute the L eigenvectors of the covariance matrix belonging to the largest eigenvalues. And this can obviously be done with standard eigenvalue analysis. And then you essentially choose the eigenvectors that then become the rows of the mapping phi from the k minus 1 to the L dimensional feature space. And this then gives us the output matrix phi. So that's essentially all for today. You looked at the rank reduced form of the linear discriminant analysis. What we want to do in the next video is we want to look at the original formulation that is then often also called the Fisher transform. So this is essentially a variant of the LDA. And I think you should know the difference between the rank reduced version that we just presented and the original transform. So I hope you like this small video and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye bye.